nice. Not gonna throw a parade or anything, but good. Not your My Chemical Romance parade. Nah, not 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 to that level, unfortunately. When I was an OT, my Katie took me into the city to see um, a mariachi band. <laughs> <laughs> Howdy, friends and lovers. Welcome back to the For Your Reference podcast. You got your host, Katie. And Doty. And bring along your finest monocle because we are having a date with a sequin mannequin beauty. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm-hmm. This week, we are covering Netflix's Umbrella Academy. Woo-hoo. Woo-hoo. Strap in, friends and lovers, or strap on if you're feeling nasty. What, what a series, OT. Mm. Uh, let's get into the stats, which is what we do around here. Uh, if you are super learned, if you had paid attention to the intro of this episode, let's pull all of our glasses up. Um, like the boys, Umbrella Academy is based off a comic of the same name by In Way of Gerard Way, who is the lead man of My Chemical Romance. Who'd have thought? Who'd have thunk it? We, 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 every time we saw interviews after watching the first season, they kept, I, they talking, kept on about talking about it. my camera yeah. roll. So I was like, it was driving me crazy. And we're wondering why, like what's <laughs> going on. Uh, and that is why, friends and lovers. Uh, and then it was adapted for TV by Steve Blackman and Jeremy Slater. It was released in the 15th of February, 2019. Mm-hmm. Uh, and on the 31st of July of 2020, season two premiered. Yep. Uh, and as we mentioned, it is uh, well adorned from Netflix. Uh, let me just rattle off uh, the actors because they are an ensemble. Um, I will go through all seven. We have Ellen Page, Tom Hopper, David Cancinetta, Emmy Raver Lampman, Robert Sheehan. Yes. Another slice, please. Aidan Gallagher. Justin H. Min. Mm-hmm. What a cast. What a cast. Uh, and we're obviously going to get through as many characters as possible, but I do want to um, lay accolade and respect to Mary J. Blige. Mm-hmm. It's not the first time uh, within reason we mentioned Mary J. Blige because we did our 30 Rock episode where she turned up as well. Yep. Um, but obviously she has more of a bolstered role um, in Umbrella Academy. So welcome, 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 friends and lovers. Uh, if you haven't watched Umbrella Academy uh, and you do not want to be spoiled in the most splooshiest of ways, um, be aware that we will be talking about spoilers of season one and also season two. We do have a delicious, delicious uh, catalogue. Um, and if you have listened to all of the episodes and you're waiting on one, let us know. That is a reference bingo um, we are yet to come across, OT. <laughs> um, there, there is a lot you can peruse. Uh, but we will be focusing on Umbrella Academy this week. So let's start off with uh, what we like to call first impressions. Um, and I, I guess it's also to provide our frame of reference, you know, who we are as people, but also who we are as viewers mm-hmm. um, as well. OT is very forgiving um, and I have very little patience. <laughs> and it all culminates together in a sensual reference podcast. <laughs> um, but let's let's talk about Umbrella Academy. Uh, it, it has been around since 2019, but we only just watched it um, a couple of months ago. And uh, I guess we can talk about if we've come across um, any of the other actors as well. Mm. Uh, well, uh, like you said, we just watched it this year, earlier this year, and... We kept on skipping it every single time we saw it on Netflix because of the poster and we're like, (laughs) yeah, I'm not, I'm not ready for this. It only got. It seemed like there was a lot of stylistic sort of effort that went into it. And you wonder if there was going to be any sort of substance, Mm. which obviously will get challenged and we'll have a proper discussion about it. But we saw the poster and we're like, okay, we get it. 
Like everyone has their competing superhero show, whether it's CW, whether it's like standalone Marvel DC um, sort of movies, who Gerard also credits um, as one of his inspirations, DC Comics, Doom Patrol um, in particular. Everyone kind of had their stake um, in the superhero world, the boys as well on Amazon. Um, So we kind of felt like we got the vibe, right? Yeah, we got the vibe. And to me, uh, it felt like it would be like a CW sort of qual- level quality. Okay. But I, I, I think we should also lay respect because you do like your CW I shows. do like my CW. Because I think the only CW I watch or did watch was Supernatural. Yeah. But you watched the whole gambit. I watched... Uh, oh, <laughs> I did. <laughs> 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 you didn't think I was going to expose you this early? No, I, I thought you'd <laughs> leave it for later in the podcast. Well, that's why we don't video podcasts because the exposing no, Sometimes you just early. want to watch things without having to overthink all the time. You know, something sometimes easy, light, much. fun. <laughs> yeah. And CW provides that in tenfold. Mm-hmm. So I thought it was something similar. I wasn't ready to indulge in that at the moment because I was taking a break from all this super uh, superheroes sort of shows. Yeah. And and once we decided to watch it, I think we binged the whole season in one weekend and we just couldn't believe how how much of idiots we are. How dare you? <laughs> oh, I was just speaking for myself. Yourself and our dog <laughs> exec producer. Um, but yeah, the, the, the first season of Umbrella Academy, mwah, four chef kisses. Exemplary, I say with a Reginald monocle. Mm-hmm. Fucking amazing! Uh, it, it was. It definitely went above and beyond in any sort of lack of expectations that we might have had for Umbrella Academy. We really didn't know what we were walking into. Yeah, because there's there's so many shows um, that even we've covered on this podcast that you can get lost in, particularly within Netflix. Um, so we we weren't expecting. Uh, I guess even emotional pull um, mm. with the characters as well. And we'll talk about that and we'll go through that as well. Um, shout out to Ellen Page. Uh, this isn't the first time that she's uh, brought a, brought a, along a cataclysmic, uh, almost maybe apocalypse. <laughs> um, I think maybe a couple of months ago we played Beyond Two Souls. Yeah. Um, so I guess just shout outs there. Tom Hopper, uh, he plays a very interesting, very similar character um, in Black Sails. Mm. Um, so definitely shout out to him. I know people credit him uh, for Game of Thrones he was barely in it no but like it, it was such a big show so I think that's mostly where people recognise uh, Tom Hopper from but we we definitely uh, lay our splooshes in the black sail direction oh yeah oh, if you tell me what Tom Hopper is known for it would be black sails without a doubt oh totally mm. totally um, and Robert Sheehan has been in Misfits which I think you've watched mm-hmm as well um but yes 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 what a series uh season two we definitely felt uh, a way about it um but i think the best way to go through this and have this tantalizing uh muy caliente discussion is to focus on the characters mm. um and then maybe at the end we can well even i guess naturally we'll start to talk about um season two and how that also unveiled as well yeah, and, and I think you mentioned something to do with the boys and it reminding you of it as a reason of why we didn't watch it at the first go. Yeah. Um, when we finished the boys, we instinctively just wanted more content for the boys and it made us read the comics. Oh, yeah. Did you get this sort of same vibe of, oh, we finished season one in as much as we enjoyed it. Did you feel the need that you wanted to read more about this? Uh, if reading the Wikipedia article of the comic counts as reading the comic, then yes. <laughs> <laughs> then yes, uh, I, I have perused uh, the literature or the lore, as uh, the kids like mm. to say, of, of Umbrella Academy. Well, it was more that there were some unanswered questions that carried through season one and didn't get addressed in season two. Um, but I think as we start to talk about the characters, we can start to, you know, you know, peel those uh, Shrek onion layers that OT loves so much. Mm-hmm. Um, but l- I guess uh, before we even dive into the seven, let's talk a bit generally about Umbrella Academy and how it all came together. Mm-hmm. 
So everyone was born on the same day in 1989 from, I'm not sure if there were varying ages, but they were from uh, young women that w didn't appear to be pregnant earlier in the day and they just popped out a baby. That's kind of the spiritual... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, I wasn't going. I'm not, I'm not going there. I, I, my trail of thought was a bit too naughty for this podcast. Yeah, I think you're channeling. <laughs> I think you're channeling your Tatiana from um, Perry Mason. Yeah, Tatiana. What? <laughs> you see, friends and lovers, OT knows references, but they are quite a few years old, unfortunately. Um, but yes, I, I guess just generally going into it, because I think even one of the opening scenes in season one was uh, a, a girl and a boy in a pool. Mm. And that's how you make a baby. That's how you make a baby. Kids <laughs> don't kiss on the lips. Because <laughs> mama don't kiss on the mouth. Yeah. Uh, I think that might have been Russia, so it might have been Vanya, but don't quote me. I think it was Vanya. Yeah. Because he's the, she's the only one from Russia. Yeah, I, mm. I think it was in Russia. Um, mm. But, you know, feel free to correct us. I love a tasty fight. Come and find us on Twitter. Um, but, yeah, it, it was interesting to see how they all came around. And in um, my very learned pulling my glasses up, um, my it's not just IMDb. I actually went to extra wiki pages. Mm, um, yeah, look right? at you. Apparently, in total, there were 43 super-powered infants that were born. 43. So to only have seven, it, it does open to the possibility of the worlds and, and, oh, yeah. and the universes. Again, as the kids like to say, there's a lot of story that can be built on mm. in mm. that. Um, and later on in the series, we do come across Lila Pitts. Mm. So I think perhaps that she might have been one of those kids as well. Yeah, she is. Or whether she was like made in a lab. And she was replicated for the powers. I guess we'll start to see. Um, come and come and subscribe to my non-existent comic, uh, <laughs> friends and lovers, the Reference Academy. Um, speaking of, we have talked about uh, spoilers, spoilers, spoilers. At the end of season two, they they kind of hinted and they kind of alluded to a reverse sort of sort of like multiverse scenario mm. where we have the Sparrow Academy. Yeah. Thoughts, feelings? I did not see it coming in as much as what we were presented with on the second season. Mm -hmm. I felt the apocalypse will be the overlying narrative for each and every season, which frustrated the hell Mate, out of it me. It was the narrative for season one and season two. Yeah, and I thought that will be its thing. That will be its stick. So every single season, it will be Vanya, having have them having to contain Vanya in some sort of way. And for them to introduce it, to introduce and this sort then. of yeah for them to introduce sparrow academy i was like you should this should have been fucking season two yeah the tether the tethered edition yeah get um, jordan peelsies in there jordan peelsies jordan peelsies jordan peelsies is my <laughs> shit uh in, in july um of 2020 gerard way did reveal that volume four of the comics would be surrounding the sparrow academy volume four okay yeah so uh i i, I couldn't gather how much was in the works and how much is just ready to go mm. um but th th it's going to be centered on something that hasn't been published yet yeah essentially well i'm glad that in the sparrow academy ben is sort of the lead because we've got we, we yeah. love we love ben so the fact that we've gotten just a few pieces of him here and there, yeah, it makes me feel happy that no, going forward, season three at least, we're going we'll, to see we're him. going to see a whole lot more of Ben. Yeah, like despite the fact it's a sort of a multiverse, <laughs> parallel universe sort of shit. Yeah, Justin H. Min must be related to Vera Farmiga because <laughs> uh, that's a Bates Motel reference, uh, friends and lovers. Um, but yeah, so I, I, I guess the reason why I wanted to bring that up is we're, we're talking about the comics, we're pulling our glasses up, um, we mentioned the boys, but yeah, so so Volume 4 um, is, is apparently in the works when it will come out, I guess uh, time will tell, um, and when Season 3 will come out, uh, time will tell. As far as I can see now, now season three hasn't been renewed but it, it's very much likely uh, mm. um i don't play poker i'm not a betting man but i would say that season three is is raring to go oh yeah for sure 
Um, yeah, but th- that's pretty much uh, the Academy as a whole. Spoiler, spoiler, spoiler. This is going to be a major spoiler. So spoiler, spoiler, spoiler. Um, again, we have many delicious, tantalizing, uh, just the sexual uh, episodes that you can go and listen to. I want to talk about Reginald mm-hmm. for a second before we go into the seven. So can we call him Reg? Oh, let's call him Reg. Or is that too familiar? No, channeling Reg from Shy. <laughs> same nice. vibe mate same nice. energy uh, make sure you watch the shy because we will be covering that very soon um i just wanted to bring up so one of the biggest uh sort of spoilers uh not spoilers but one of the biggest sort of plot points or reveals um that we had in season two is that reginald is not only was he a questionable man picking up babies all around the world mm. Unlike OT, because those babies belong to you. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, so as far as we understand, Sir Reginald is an alien. Yeah. So it, it's Goku Reginald. Goku Reginald. We're is going to have correct. a Dragon Ball crossover. Mm-hmm. You heard that unofficially on so, the so, so who will be the Krillin in this? Oh, it's got to be Diego. <laughs> 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 Not Luther. No, because I think he's more of um, Oolong. Mm, yeah. Like yeah. even more useless. Yeah. Um, <laughs> th- that's to satiate our uh, anime Dragon Ball fans because it's been a while since we've done an anime, right, OT? Bloody hell, yeah. It has been a while. And I, and I think I have such an idea of what, I, what the sort of next anime should be. So it's something that you'd have to watch because you refuse to watch the first go. Uh, well, I guess that's another tantalizing morsel for you, friends and lovers. Um, but what do you think? What do you think about Sir Reginald being from an alien species? They kind of hinted at it. Uh, we saw sort of this, you know, Clark Kent. Um, um, what what planet is Clark Kent from? Colob. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, Krypton, I think. Yeah. And how it got destroyed and stuff. They sort of foreshadowed that he was not of earth because we saw this sort of um the ships leaving a planet and he Uh was there with i think his lover because there was all this heartfelt sort of emotions going on in season one so okay did you get like the the extended edition (laughs) no it was there it was there (laughs) i just pay attention mate so i was like they, they didn't just show this for us to be like this is nothing because there are ships leaving the planet literally. Mm-hmm. So it made it made us think of Reginald not being of from Earth, whether or not he he looked the way he did. True. <laughs> True. We didn't know. So it got me excited in terms of surely there has to be more of him. We can't kind of just kill him off and then start season two and not knowing no. anything about Reg. Yeah. Like that that would be the the worst uh Martha X Markina to introduce an alien species and then just kill them off. <laughs> yeah, that would be a Martha moment. Uh more Martha than Dragon Ball Evolution, but I think I guess we'll leave that alone. Mm. Um, at least for today. Uh, but it was interesting. It was interesting to see how he navigated that. His death was obviously the catalyst of bringing the seven together because they were separated for some time and then they uh, reassemble, non-trademark, um, to come together to fight the powers that be. Mm-hmm. And then I guess Vanya turns out to be the powers that be <laughs> for season one <laughs> and also for season two. So let's talk about the seven. Um <sighs> I guess you could call it a bit rough, but uh, now knowing the sort of uh, entity that Reginald is, um, or Reg, as his best friends like to call him, uh, I, I guess it's not that shocking that he just gave them numbers. Yeah. Um, in the comics, they also they actually had uh, pseudo sort of names for them. Space Boy is kind of the only one that uh, emerges from the surface in the series. Oh. Um, but let's let, let's go through all of them. What I thought was re- really interesting was Reginald actually uh, ranked them based on their individual usefulness. So why was Luther in this? Exactly, 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 exactly. And that's what I wanted to talk about. Do you think it's not just the power that they have, but also their ability to learn and also obedience? I think that's also it as well. 
that would make sense in t- in in the sense that he made Vanya number seven because she was too powerful and she could not she be couldn't controlled. Be controlled. So yeah. the fact that yeah, I, I could see that. Yeah. I could see so that. so so uh, I guess let's just go through the seven, but let let's keep that in mind. Let's think about the powers, but I guess let's also think about the temperaments um, and the personalities of the characters as well. So we have Luther Hargreaves. Space Boy, also known as Number One. Um, so his noted powers and abilities are superhuman strength, which I, I guess is pretty cool, but it, it's it's pretty low level sort of power. Like the only worst power you would have, not worse, but the only pedestrian. There you go. Mm. If you'll pardon the pun, is super speed. That is the worst fucking. That is the worst no, power you can, you can do have. No, you can do some interesting things with super speed because Flash has that. And Flash can do a lot of amazing shit. Interesting, but not satisfying. Ew. <laughs> <laughs> you Flash could run round and create a, a time portal dimension sort of thing, which Luther can't. He can't lift the time space <laughs> continuum. Just ah, my energy and my power created yeah. a vacuum. No, nah, mate, that, that wouldn't work. His power is the most useless thing ever. Yeah. Uh, hmm. I don't know why you hold this flag for Flash, but we don't have time and we don't have a couch <laughs> to go through that sap. Um, so he has superhuman strength, but he also has a noted ability of enhanced resilience. <laughs> Um, that sounds very wafty and very wankery, but they're talking about his actual body. Like his physical body has been further amplified by new ape-like physiology. So that's what it means. It's not like <laughs> it's not like his uh, sense of being. <laughs> <laughs> so so he has superhuman strength. He, he didn't go to some serious therapy sessions and just built a, a monument of <laughs> resilience with him. <laughs> oh. <laughs> he needed some enhanced resilience when he found all his fucking moon rocks in the floorboards. Oh, jeez. <laughs> that was too sad. Yeah. I know we explored some very dark themes, but to see someone like Luther experience that, it's not the most, like, because obviously we have Alison and she's going through the civil rights movement, <laughs> but I felt more sad for Luther because I don't think he had the resources equipped in him to handle that pain because it was a chosen one from from when he was a baby but i think it's most docile and i think it's most obedient Mm. so i think that that tips the scales in my definition of why reginald um counted him as the first because we have time travel we have um you know communicating with the dead we have delicious hentai tentacles and how is luther number one (laughs) right (laughs) yep but uh, I, I, it's Tom Hopper. We fucking love you. And you'll hear the same thing when we cover Black Sails. Um, but he's just a character well to do. I mm. think I think that's the letter face uh, pretty much um, for Luther's character. He's And then he kind of became like the comic relief in season two. Yeah. Like, I guess the, the emotional pull that we had from him was very strong in season one. Um, and we were building to the moon rocks in the floorboards. Mm. What is it? What a phrase. What a triggering phrase for him. Mm-hmm. Um, and then in season two, he kind of just took a backseat and he kind of just became the comic relief, I felt. Yeah, I, I felt the same Like as any well. sort of dimension he might have had kind of wasted away. Yeah, he definitely took a backseat because we just see him... Uh, of course, he's just gone completely off the rails because Alison isn't there anymore. He's fighting in some underground sort of onomaeus like style battle. Spartacus reference. And then we have him sort of these scenes where he's just eating to sort of alleviate any sort of tension yeah. or or problems he might have. I'm like, yeah, all fun and all fun and games and not whatnot. But at the end of it. This is a character who had so many dimensions in the first season. Nah, he had dimensions. <laughs> 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 I feel like they watched a montage of Brad Pitt eating during films and they thought, yeah, I'm going to apply this to Space Boy. Yeah, I didn't really care for that. But we have someone who not only was the leader of the group, saw himself. Was he there? He I was. think no one wanted to step up. If no one wants to step up and you're the leader, are you really a leader, though? It doesn't matter how you get that title, mate. Nah. As long as you're there and he's, 
trying to pull. Well, we, we know I all these people are you, flawed. I see you gunning for my podcast throne and how dare you. Oh, it's guarding, mate. I think he, he kind of tries to keep the peace wherever he can. He's like the peacekeeper and he's the comic relief. That That's as much as I would say about Luther. Yeah, he, I'd say he's the most logical one. No, I don't think so. You reckon? How many hair braids... How many harebrained plants did he have? Even with Diego, when they were calling that <laughs> poor old lady. Uh, they were looking for some Olga and they were threatening her. Mm. Exactly. So there you go. Uh, right, Rewind right. and feel shame. <laughs> shame. There's a Game of Thrones reference. Obligatory. Uh, so there you go. There, there's Luther. Um, I feel like the only Luther I want in my TV shows slash movies is Idris Elba as Luther. That's it. Mm. Like, that's all. They're going to do a Luther movie, by the They're way. They're going to do a Luther movie. Yeah, yeah. So very much excite. It's Who cr- needs James Bond when you're Luther? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Fucking brilliant. Make sure you go and watch Luther, friends and lovers. Uh, let's move on to number two. We have Diego Hargreaves. His name in the comic was The Kraken. The Kraken. And obviously known as number two. He has three abilities or skills. He has trajectory manipulation, which is pretty much doing salt with a knife. <laughs> is salt the one with the bending yeah, bullets? Yeah, salt is the one with the bending bullets. I'm doing the motion, so that's further exemplifying. We need to play charades again with people. Mm. I don't think I should you've be got, around You've got people. the motion locked, mate. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Mm. Um, trajectory, manipulation. I think that's pretty straightforward. We mm. don't really need to go into that. Um, so he can bend shit. He's also a master knife thrower. What the fuck is the difference between... Okay, he's a master <laughs> knife thrower and he's a master combatant. Okay. I think he was the best in, in hand-to-hand combat. Yep, because he had shit all else to give. Damn, dog. You're <laughs> saying that after we talked about Luther, really? True. Well, he's not the worst. He's not the worst. <laughs> it's interesting that he was number two. But then again, maybe they were ranked because these abilities are much more closer to human sort of abilities, right? So maybe they 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 exemplified their powers much earlier than the harder sort of summoning of the dead. That's not something easy. But we saw we saw Diego stop bullets at this in season two. Actually, yeah. Why so. the fuck was he not doing that the whole series? <laughs> so I'm not sure where his powers lie in because he can stop You're bullets. You're right. You're right. He can stop bullets. Um, <laughs> Why does he ever get injured? <laughs> Just Actually, for you're right. No, you're absolutely right. <laughs> How many times did he get fucking injured? Why didn't... Oh, maybe his powers... Because remember his girlfriend died um, at the hands of Cha-Cha mm. in season one. So I guess he can't remove the bullet once it's been put in. But in any case, that's a very, very strong power to have not use. I think you're you're trying to transpose um Kristen Stewart's powers of a shield where she could <laughs> <laughs> where she could shield other people. <laughs> I shield you from every magical effect. Doesn't work like that here. That was a very butters uh command. It was, wasn't it? Yeah. Um, check, listen to our uh, Twilight episode. You'll notice it's the episode before this one. Mm. Uh, I, but I just like Diego as a character. I fucking like him. I think he's great to have around. I like how emotional he is. I like how he goes from zero to 100. Nah, um, he, he wasn't he's my not, favorite. He's not useful in a real world situation. Mm. But in a watching situation, it, it's fun. It's fun to watch him want to watch everything burn. It's crazy that the first two um, in Luther and Diego are the most messed up with the most daddy issues ever. Daddy and mommy issues. Mm. Yeah. Oh, mommy issues. I even forgot Diego's mommy issues. <laughs> How could you forget? <laughs> Didn't you see yourself on the screen, my love? Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> with grace. Mm-hmm. With grace. Uh, I thought it was interesting uh, in season two that grace was actually a real person. It, I just assumed that he created this perfect woman. Mm. I didn't realize, I don't know what kind of fucked up shit. I don't know if he turned the real woman into it or if he, he modeled it after her. I think she, I think he killed her and then turned her into a robot because he still loves her. And now she could have the perfect heart in a sort of programmable way. 
friends and lovers, I- if you've ever listened to any of our episodes and you wonder, how the fuck are these two a couple? OT just perfectly described our type of love. <laughs> <laughs> striking urethras mm-hmm. OT um, but interesting you are com- actually I fucking I fucking love that yes Luther's got his daddy issues and Diego's got his mummy Oedipus issues yep wow that's fucking interesting mm. uh, but I, I don't think we have the time and or mental capacity <laughs> um, <laughs> to deal with that today speaking of mental capacity we now have number three Alison Hargreaves uh, and her name in the comics was The Rumor which I guess you can kind of guess yep um as well the most so straightforward sort of name she either. her powers was the most confusing and the most frustrating out of the seven mm. because you know whenever you watch something you enter into a world and if it's a good world or if it's a good story it starts to dictate to you what the limitations are Okay. of that world mm-hmm. right what can be done what can't be done um, usually it's done through trial and error of the character going through the story um, sometimes it's just literal exposition mm. where it's explained to us right um, a- as far as we understood in the series all she has to do was i heard a rumor yeah. There, there's, there's no uh, limitations in in what she can get people to do, how much of their own free will needs to be relinquished in order for that to happen. Um, and even reading up, um, again, on my very learned wiki pages, uh, even in the comic, there, there doesn't seem to be any sort of restrictions in regards to what her character can do. Also, interestingly enough, in the comic, it appeared as though she actually used her powers on Luther. So how much of Luther actually feels genuine towards Alison is oh. into question because she needed, she, I guess she's that sort of woman that needs to be comforted by a man. See Bella in our last episode. Um, so she actually used Luther for that emotional sort of comfort. Wow. Yeah, and apparently she was way more manipulative in the comic and they try to make her more agreeable for the Why TV did it show. change her so much then? I think, you know, very similar to what we were saying about the boys. You know, the boys was fucking salacious and it was gratuitous and it was sexual. It, it was way more sexual than we could handle. Mm. Like, look at the first scene of the first volume of the boys. <laughs> um I, I guess maybe to make it more palatable, make it make it more uh, rating friendly. I'm not sure, but uh, apparently, or maybe it's just because Allison's not a throwaway character, and they want people to like her from the outset. Okay, all that makes sense, but then you end up with a character who watered down. Yes, lofty. Yes, indecisive. Yes, and that I guess that was the that was the qualms, the foundational qualms that we had with Allison. So let's quickly go through her skills and abilities. She has mental manipulation. So prefacing a statement with "I heard a rumor," and it doesn't even it doesn't even specify whether she needs to directly be talking to someone. Mm. Or can she, she just shout it to the in the I'm room sure and she can shout it out control to everyone. everyone? Yeah, because mm. that would be a much stronger power than just doing it one person individually. I have a rumor whispering in someone's ear. Rumor <laughs> has it, and then that's it, right? Um, so it's mental manipulation, and uh, one of her abilities is that she's a skilled combatant. Um, so it's, I guess the same sort of everyone. All of them are skill combatants, so it doesn't count pretty much. as a skill, does pretty it? Pretty much, but I, I I guess it's the filler. It's it's a it's a stocking stuffer. Just like <laughs> most of them speak five languages, it doesn't mean that it's like they were taught like that. So yeah, right. It's the default setting, mate. <laughs> okay, Ot Beekman. You're welcome. Archer reference. Meh meh meh. Um, but yeah, th- there was a lot that came into question with Allison's uh, character because a lot of the times we're understanding the power limitations. But I think a lot of hers was her morality. But it's like, and also in the comics, uh, her husband, Patrick, she actually used it on him. Whoa, that's and she interesting. Used it, she used it to further her career, but I don't think she was a celebrity in the comics, but she used it in her career. Um, but apparently it, it was much more fleshed out that she used it in the comics. That right? would make so much sense because what the Alison we have 
on Netflix is an Alison that's so timid, afraid yeah. to use her own power. And apparently, the only time she used the power was uh, was on the daughter, and then yeah. she just stopped completely. Yeah. And I'm like, mate, why are you even here? Why are we even seeing you right now? Like, it kind of makes me feel like Michael C. Hall's Dexter is more virtuous than her. Because it, <laughs> <laughs> because at least he was targeting, like, people that deserved it. I have a code. <laughs> I man, live by a code. Man, got to have a code. Mm. And that is the reference trilogy of all. Um, but, yeah, because all we saw in the TV show was her using it on her fucking kid. What? <laughs> <laughs> and like and to have such a big plot point it kind of undoes any sort of goody goody nature that you try to attach to it because i think she just wanted a kid to shut up i literally think that's what it was in the tv show mm. and, and does she has to does she have to say it verbally like I have a room avoid to activate or can she yeah. mentally think it just because even in season two uh when we had the Swedes uh come to her place with her new husband she was grunting and groaning on the floor it's like mate I'm pretty sure you can whisper I heard a rumor right now <laughs> yeah yeah like yeah. <laughs> well, how does this because again I try to look into it and it was it doesn't even seem like it's uh, should there you be eye the contact point. should there be what are the rules with this what are we what are living around Alison what are her restrictions because currently there need to be restrictions because if there are no restrictions and that's just a fucking weak story mm. Mm. Um. yeah so apparently also in the comics even further to what much much further than what we saw in the series she can actually slightly alter reality so oh. as as far as we understand the realms even though they're very weak realms um she she can she can bend people's actions and behaviors to her own desires mm -hmm. right but in the comics she can slightly alter reality what that means is if she goes into a store and very topical there's no toilet paper she can actually imagine that to appear oh that's fucking powerful yeah yeah i'm not sure either what are in how down we were shortchanged uh and you know uh emmy was also shortchanged but uh she i think her character was white in the comic so credit where credit is due uh i heard a rumor that there were definitely some structural issues particularly in regards to allison Mm. how many times even when her husband uh how many times i think when they were having a community meeting in the salon mm. and they had i think he was a he he owned a lot of buildings mm. right but he didn't own that building that they were meeting in she very easily could have said um you know after she beat him up i heard a rumor you're never going to tell anyone about this and that's everything solved in regards to him. Yeah. How and the house, but yeah. like it was ridiculous. I think this is also a perfect time to bring it up as well. When when we when we ended season one and we started season two, pretty much up until episode five and six, it was focusing on one character and their lives during that one, two, or three years, depending on when they landed in that uh, timeline. Mm -hmm. Right? I felt like a lot of those stories didn't feel lived in. Like, Alison just got plonked together with her husband and it's like, okay. Like, I felt no chemistry between them and it's it's not to say anything about the acting ability. I think it was more, th like, like, we weren't given an inkling into the world. It's just like, yep, this is happening. We're just going to put them together. Um, you know, it, it was interesting to have that storyline of the civil rights movement. Um, but it just felt like it was just thrown in together as opposed to it feeling lived in. Mm. Yeah, the same with mean. Sissy and Vanya as well. Mm. Um, yeah, I, I, I just wanted, I wanted to care more about Alison as a character. But like we said, like her, her lack of tenacity um, became watered down. So mm. we, we kind of really didn't get a sense of who she was because she kept saying it was her, her moral fiber that was stopping her from doing stuff. And then people are fucking suffering around her. But you didn't <laughs> mind using it on your kid. <laughs> so there was a lot of disparity uh, that was going on with Alison. Let's move on uh, to, I think, my favorite. I would definitely, definitely, definitely uh, say is my favorite, Klaus. Klaus, the cult Num leader. Number four. Uh, and he, in the comics, was known as the Seance. 
Okay, that's appropriate. Very appropriate. Uh, so the two uh, skills and abilities he has is mediumship. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, we, we, we can talk about it in more detail, but it's essentially being able to communicate with spirits. And then so we Jennifer Love Hewitt sort of thing? Yes. Okay, yeah. Um, how, how, how much of that was, was research, OT? A hundred percent. Jennifer Love Huge Tits. Was that in Scream? um and then his second skill or ability is evocation Mm. so that's him being able to summon the dead so he can talk to them if they're there but he can also summon them um part of the explanation about reginald not appearing at the funeral was he was being very stubborn (laughs) and he just didn't want to be summoned Actually, that adds um, extra complexity and more accolades to Klaus because not only was he summoning, you know, a, a spirit, but he was also summoning an extraterrestrial, mm. right? Yeah. Um, that, that's just more splooshes in my Klaus mountain. <laughs> um, so, so let's talk about Klaus. I think uh, if you're watching it on surface level, um, you can see... A, a, a very a very fun and tantalizing character full of salaciousness and frivolity but if you peel back uh you know the the presenting sort of layers within klaus you can see that he has a lot more depth to him Mm. and he actually has an anchorage within the group and when they choose to listen to him he actually has a lot to offer he adds a lot of depth in this yeah absolutely And, and we can see like in the first season, I think I wasn't bought into Klaus. At least the first five episodes. Yeah. And I was like, yeah. what are they trying to... I want to like? say five though, but yeah, I, I agree that there is an initial... A bulk of the first, ep- first episodes on season one. Okay. I hadn't fully bought into Klaus. And he, mm-hmm. he seemed like a spoiled brat. He seemed like he didn't want responsibilities. Mm-hmm. He seemed just... He was very one-dimensional. Yeah. yeah. And I was like, what's up with him? And then once we start to uncover, you yeah. know, once we start peeling that onion, yeah, then we get to see who Klaus is as a character, mm-hmm. his personality, and and how much he cares, and and the storyline with him and Dave. Oh, oh. the uh, according to the series and also in the comics, the only reason he ever even tried to attempt sobriety was to try and conjure Dave. Ooh. And we also heard it in the show as well. He, he, Dave was the only person that he ever loved more than himself. Mm. Any sort of entanglements. <laughs> can I just say, I said entanglements on the podcast well You before. did, way before. Yeah, Jada must be listening in. Yeah, so mm. I listened to our first Insecure episode. I think that's the first time I said entanglement. Um, but a, a lot of his sort of entanglements that he had was because he needed a place to stay um, most of the time or he, he, he just needed some sort of anchorage. I feel like Klaus is definitely the most satisfying character to watch. Um, he was very sure of himself. It was more us starting to understand who he was and what he went through. Mm. Um, and I, I like even imagining yourself, like we got flashbacks in season two of when Ben died, right? Yeah. And you see how hard Klaus took it. And then you see baby Klaus and baby Ben for the first time and Ben not passing over. And for a lot of the series, we felt like Ben stayed around for Klaus. Yeah, yeah. That was fucking heartfelt. It was really heartfelt. And that was that was what kept me going through season two because there was a lot of bullshit and frivolity going <laughs> on, um, especially with particular storylines. But Klaus and Ben alone, I could live a thousand lifetimes in that. Yeah, I appreciated that. Especially when sort of Ben died at the end. Because Spoiler. if you're this far... <laughs> And you've not stopped. Motherfuckers do it, babe. It's your fault. Anyway, right. when he does at the end, and, and the one thing he tells Vanya, uh-huh. tell Klaus that I stayed behind, not because of him, 
but because I was scared. I think more, part of it was because class was feeling guilty. Yeah. That it took the one opportunity for Ben to go towards the light, you know, and just be free from the world. And I was just, oh, I loved it so much. Me too. And it's funny because we get on this podcast and we talk mad shit and we're like, this wasn't perfectly constructed. But once 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 the tethers have latched on to me emotionally in regards to characters, I fucking feel everything I need to feel, mm. right? Mm. Because the whole way along, uh, particularly it ramped up in season two with Ben, he was being very judgy and he, everything he ever said was, to Klaus was very judgmental. And I'm like, why the fuck? Get lost then, right? Uh-huh. But even though I was feeling that, Fucking tears, man. <laughs> Even Vanya talking, I was like, oh, I was not I was not ready for this. And then there was that switch when we realized that Ben wasn't going to be able to leave. Yeah. He was actually going to pass over because he was ready to move on. Mm. Right? And I think a lot of that, um, you know, a, a lot of that had to do with him not experiencing what he felt like he needed to experience. But... Again, we can go into that once we talk about Ben. But going back to Klaus, he has immense power. And we saw that nearing the end of season one, particularly when Klaus, uh, you know, is kidnapped by Chacha and also Hazel, Mm. right? And there's literally no way for him to escape aside from his own actions and his own volition. He was also sober at the time, not by choice. Um, So he was able to summon that. And a lot of that we saw the spirits that were haunting Chacha and Hazel I guess for lack of a better word, coming to life and manifesting themselves to Klaus and he was able to utilise that. He literally had his own ghost army Mm. and Mm. we never really got to see that to that level again. No other ghosts followed him. (laughs) He couldn't raise any sort of ghost like army. Mm. Are you telling me in those fields where Sissy lived, there were no bodies there that he could summon at all? Does it work with proximity of where he is and where he stands? I think he can just conjure up any sort of dead, the dead. I, I would agree with that, but I would say in regards to the series, we haven't seen the build up to that. So I would say that that would be something that you work up to mm. because it would be even more of a barrier to understand his powers. Yeah, maybe so. Because the, the way I took it was Chacha and Hazel's victims were following them around. Mm. They were in like some sort of purgatory, right? Um, so it, it was, I, I, I fucking love Klaus as a cult leader. I, I think it makes sense in every sense of the way. Mm-hmm. More than a Jared Leto uh, sort of leadership, I'll be there with Klaus's flyers. <laughs> <laughs> um, Klaus was magnificent. Mm-hmm. In way of character development, in way of complication, in way of fanfare. Mm-hmm. To see him experience what he experienced with Dave was something that, you know, even people that haven't experienced romantic love can relate to on some level. Yeah. When you stop fussing about your own, uh, you know, also valid, but your own issues and you want to give everything to someone else. Mm. And that was what that's what Klaus brought to this series. To know that every time he's sober, he would some like the spirits would come to him and that's when his power would be the strongest alludes to a very sad childhood. Yeah. So a very sad um, you know, adolescence. And we also had flashbacks of, you know, Reginald throwing him in a grave. Uh-huh. <laughs> like just letting letting the spirits come to Klaus and, you know, to to I, I guess to apply it in as much as you can into real life, that would be a lot for anyone to have to handle. It would be. Really so would be. so all of that sort of one dimensional sex, drugs and rock and roll that we have with Klaus, it, it, it starts to feel a more realistic and more resonating sort of picture of what it's like to escape and what it's like to deal with your vices. Mm. Vices that were created to to drown out the world essentially. Yeah. 
Um, but before this turns into a Klaus cult love fest, mm-hmm. oh, that was a tasty morsel to have in my mouth. Sure it was. <laughs> Let's move on to, I would say, my second favorite character. Mm-hmm. Uh, five. Five didn't even get a name. His name in the comic was The Boy. <laughs> Brahms, if you're nasty. Brahms. Mm-hmm. Um, so five has a lot. Five has a lot. I'm just going to read what the skills and abilities are because it is a lot. Uh, teleportation. Mm-hmm. Chronokinesis. Master combatant, master assassin, super genius intelligence, and also intimidation. Okay. Master producer, super DJ, hey? Yeah. DJ Khaled in the walks, eh? <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. Um, five is great. Yeah. He he he's he's the one I think we fast we took to quickest. Oh yes. Um we latched onto him very quickly. Yeah. Like What's not to like about him? He knows his goals. He knows what he has to do. He doesn't let feelings come in his way. And I think most of that has to do with the fact that he stayed alone for 42 fucking years. Oh, yeah. So there's no room for bullshit. That was some I am legend shit. Yeah. At least Will Smith had a dog, mate. <laughs> but he's an icon chilling. <laughs> I'm just an icon podcasting. Oh, no. look at oh, you. Yeah, yeah. Splooshy sploosh OT. Mm-hmm. Um, five was very interesting. Uh, Aiden Gallagher is very frightening in the sense that, you know, a, a lot of the times, and again, I'll reference our Twilight episode because we just did it, um, especially in regards to Taylor Lawton and playing Jacob. Like, it bothers me because you have precocious children, but even more than that, I get annoyed when I see kids act or sing about subject matter that they just don't understand, mm. right? You might be a good singer, but you don't understand what it's like to be retching on the floor and, you know, feeling that real grown love, right? Yeah. Um, but Aiden Gallagher is very frightening because I believed his whole performance. I did too. Like, I, I, need, I need actual evidence that he's not secretly, like, the orphan. <laughs> he's, like, he's, he's 35 <laughs> years old <laughs> suffering for some condition <laughs> yeah. because he's he's so believable even aiden just as a person um you know if you watch interviews he he really is the way he is um on umbrella academy without any pressure because he's young um i guess another tidbit is he actually couldn't be present for a lot of the gun scenes oh. as per the law um but yeah it's just interesting because he plays that role so well i do worry because sometimes when people play roles so well it's hard for them to like latch on to the next project from, yeah yeah but at the same time like we're just here to enjoy it mm. no i feel like his feature is gonna be big um what mm-hmm. he's producing umbrella academy i think he'll be able to replicate it because it's it's so the things he does man like it's so nuanced and the fact that he's able to convince us that this kid yeah can 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 has the capacity to, to to handle all the shit that's going around in this world and to pretty much be the leader of the group oh yes in not so many words because he's probably he's the one that's pushing the agenda of actually saving the world the one thing they've all been brought up to try and do uh-huh. something that they've all sort of ran away from because of daddy issues or mommy issues. Can I point out that you called five the leader? Yeah, he is. And then like 20 minutes ago, you said that Luther was the leader. I just, well, I just want to make that comparison very clear. Just because Luther is the sort of mandated leader. I'm the leader because Papa said so. Papa but said that so. doesn't mean that he's the leader just be- when it comes to the interactions with the group and the interactions with his family. You could, you could, you okay, could, you that could, just you sounds could. like a participation award. You're either, <laughs> <laughs> you're either the leader or you're not. Well, well, you're five the leader. carries himself <laughs> as the leader then. If yeah, that does. makes it easy for he you does. to swallow. Oh my. Mm. I thought we weren't talking about post-podcast activities, my love. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but five definitely is the leader in every sense of the word. Whether he would be the leader if he hadn't have been overzealous and disappeared and he had grown up with them, I guess is a story for another day. But um, it, it is all to the benefit of the group. Mm. 
Um, and I'm pretty sure the web searches for sequined mannequins went up catastrophically. <laughs> <laughs> during season one of the account the fact that he he's a young kid and he was able to make us believe in the love that he had for a mannequin acting is a fucking craft mm-hmm. thaspians still exist mm-hmm. it's not just dukes 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 yeah it's dolores 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 <laughs> swinging motherfucking dolores <laughs> Uh, but five definitely gives a lot. And I guess if he wasn't there, there wouldn't really be a show. No, not really. They'll all have died. Yeah, five Five is the foundation of Umbrella Academy. Mm. And I will not hair otherwise. Oh, yeah. Uh, shall we move on, my love? Yep. Okay, so we've talked a bit about Ben, but let, let's give him the credit he deserves. So uh, he is number six, and in the comics he is referred to as the horror. The horror? Not the Rocky horror, just the horror. Oh, okay. So a little less jazzy. Uh, the first in his skill or abilities is Eldritch Tentacles. Oh, that that's a weird way to spell hentai. <laughs> um it's essentially the tentacles you see protruding out of his stomach i don't know if that's how sex works uh i guess arcs ot after hours um and then also possession Mm. that's an interesting one because i i I guess it depends on is it a matter of whether ben has a strong possession ability or is it about whether the person that is about to be possessed is more willing to be possessed. I'd argue that the possession ability comes from Klaus rather than interesting Ben, because Klaus is the one that's conjuring up ghosts. They're tethered, yeah. So <laughs> whether or not you can possess him, it's based solely on Klaus. It's not a Ben ability, is it? Well. I I would I would uh, argue with you uh, very deliciously because he was able to possess Vanya and stop the apocalypse, right? So so in some way he does get that merit. I forgot about that. Do you just think <laughs> <laughs> plot twist? Uh-huh. Smoke, Smoke bomb. bomb, yeah. Krieger reference, Archer reference. Uh, I couldn't exactly see what because. Because he died, right? Mm -hmm. Mysterious circumstances, and I still don't think it's very clear how How? or why or who's responsible for his death. But I wonder what his his actual ability was. Mm. Because that happens after you die, right? Or did he always have that? The tentacles is he's always had that because of yes, we see that in the bank. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, We see that. So I think the possession one just comes later, or he discovers it later. But does that mean all of them will have possession when they die eventually? If they die and get conjured by class for 10 or so more years, then maybe that... I, l- I love how you say that class is the gateway. Class is the gateway. That Those is some be. merch. That is some merch right there. Class mm-hmm. is the gateway. Um, but there you go. Uh, and obviously a lot of the emotional uh, payoff that we have for season two is Ben finally crossing over. Mm-hmm. Um, and obviously Vanya shares uh, his final thoughts with Klaus yeah. as well. Um, I think those were my favorite pairings, Ben yeah. and Klaus. Yeah. Uh, I really enjoyed uh, seeing them together. As much as Ben bothered me, at the same time, he talked a lot about, you know, it, it, it's like wanting to experience a hug, but you can't fully receive it. Mm. And one of his final moments that was very very emotional was him wanting to hug Vanya so he could actually feel it yeah for real um because e- even via Klaus it wasn't fully him mm. um so I thought that was a very beautiful sort of send-off um it didn't even give me time to get pissed off that we are going to have Ben again like don't kill off characters for emotional payoff and then bring them back <laughs> Just like Taylor from The Bold and the Beautiful. Mm-hmm. Spoiler, spoiler, spoiler. But if oh, you have a spoiler <laughs> for Bold and the Beautiful. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> and that was ages ago, mate. If if anyone has yeah. not watched Bold and the Beautiful and sitting here think, oh, I'd start watching it from what? What year was that? 96? 
It was yeah. ages ago, man. Some 1950s housewife is clutching her <laughs> pearls right now. Um, but the, there you go. Uh, we, we do try and uh, give our spoilers. Taylor. Oh, my God. I forgot <laughs> about that nonsense. <laughs> well, it was either Taylor or Brooke, right? Yeah. Oh, they, well, it was always Kim Taylor. They were the OG, the boy is mine. Mm. The mm. ridge is mine. But uh, happy fat dawn, man. <laughs> are we slowly becoming the bold and beautiful podcast yes we are i prefer thorn i don't know anything about Cause, cause let's 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 take a moment to uh you know spill our seed and lay our splooshies bold and the beautiful is the coke of soap dramas mm. whether it's coca-cola or whether it is pure coke Right, <laughs> days of our lives is like the Pepsi. <laughs> like, yep, fair right? enough. I can see that. Yep, it's the it it's it's the one you text at three a.m. But it's not the one you're going home mm. to. Uh, well, there you go. If anyone wanted an insight into what we would sound like as a soap opera, well, podcast, the original Thorn before they replaced him with some <laughs> wonky ass looking man. <laughs> no, you need to accept all. <laughs> no, you just except have to for, take the fast Thorn. Except for Ridge, because that was very painful. Yeah, that was. I don't think my mom has ever recovered from it. <laughs> Neither did I. Oh, I. they did a whole media circuit of the guy that plays Ridge, and he came to Australia. It was a whole thing. Really? Yeah, don't worry about it. I guess we can continue this on Twitter, but it was a whole <laughs> it was a whole situation. Uh but l- I guess let's just leave it there. Mm. <laughs> um let's come to full circle number 7, Vanya Hargraves, the white violin. The white violin with all the powers in the world. The plot device. <laughs> plot device, archetype Everything you want to throw at her, she yeah. will be the one. Oh, and her love interest in the first season, he has a persnickety face. Like if persnickety was personified in a face, that it would be that guy. Mm. I, I half expected Tench to come up and say, are you serious? Look at the person you're dating. <laughs> <laughs> like, like a projector screen yeah. being like, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> this is what a fucking asshole looks like. Yep. This is like Mindhunter episode just waiting to explode. Which we need to cover. Mm. We were waiting for another season, but, uh, you know, <laughs> life is non-linear, apparently. Mm-hmm. Uh, Vanya Hargraves, it, it was hard to latch on her as a character, even though I think a lot of us would be Vanya, at least the first early Vanya of being useless and being around people that are super gifted. Yeah, you, you've got to write that book, mate. Vanya is the indie podcast <laughs> of the seven. <laughs> Just mm. looking around at, you know, all of the big podcasts around her. Um, but yeah, I I have a problem when characters become the most important thing. Mm-hmm. Like JJ from Criminal Minds, yeah. AJ Cook, I'm looking at you. Like it just bothers me when a character becomes, you know, every single orifice they're involved in. You need a, a special agent who can do roundhouse kicks, who can shoot. Save yourself from terrorists. Save yourself. <laughs> be Jack Bauer, be Schofield, be everyone you want in one. Yeah. Be out of BC. <laughs> Pretty much. Um, I I just have a personal uh, abhorrence to characters that become everything in the show. And that's kind of what we were seeing with Vanya. Um, She's also the foundational qualm that I have with Umbrella Academy, if I were to have qualms, because at the end of season one, she did cause an apocalypse, but they didn't suffer it. They actually, you know, zoomed back in time. Mm -hmm. But then she also triggers it again. But then we kind of get an almost apocalypse. So we're edging, like we're edging our way to a real apocalypse. Vanya will always be the cause. So I'm I'm here sitting. I'm ready for season two. I'm waiting. Give me a fucking different storyline. Season three. No, season two. We just watched season two. Oh, you're saying, okay. Right, right, I right. was waiting for something different. Mm-hmm. Don't give me the fu- the same fucking season. Yeah, we got the same thing, yeah. We just sort of stretched out storylines in between that didn't even mean, make any sort of sense in the overarching sort of narrative it was to the level of naruto ostrich ninja filler (laughs) 
because uh, the first five to six episodes, the the the, the storylines, especially with Vanya and Sissy, they didn't feel real. They just felt like they were there. So the first five, almost six episodes were nothing. Mm. Like we knew that there was an apocalypse and they all got spread out and we needed them to regroup. Mm. But nothing happened until episode five or six. And that was fucking annoying. Yeah. Um, I don't necessarily like having topsy turvy um sort of narratives, which is what we're getting with the Sparrow Academy. Like for me, that's very season five, season six, season ten of a show, not oh. a season three. But after having two Edge Lord apocalypses, <laughs> um, I most welcome a Sparrow Academy, especially with Ben at the helm. I wonder if they'll do opposite powers. That's usually how it works, right? Yeah. They have opposite much. powers, so their strength is their weakness. Mm. right grasshopper mm -hmm. um let me quickly read off since i did everyone else's skills and abilities this is a long list uh so vanya we have audio kinesis telekinesis flight sound projection energy projection force field generation matter manipulation enhanced hearing atmokinesis power distribution telepathic link expert vinyl violinist mm. But why the fuck did she get knocked out like when they're in the farm? I don't know. <laughs> and if she So would power distribution explain why she could be able to She can save share her powers kid? with Harlan, yeah. Mm. But then why doesn't she just kiss all of her siblings and then they can get some of the power too? But she he she brought that kid back to life. So is once you get her power, you get revitalized and you come back to life if you're dead? Can he? Can she do the same thing to Ben's cops? Right. Why What's does she the ever limit? try? Uh, <laughs> that is some necrophilic shit that we are not. <laughs> we are definitely actually no, 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 no. When Ben was hugging Vanya, why didn't she try kissing him then? Take my power! Oh my god, she could have kissed him then. Mm. Wow. Mm. Sixpence, none the richer, hey? No, nah, no, nah, man. Under the milky twilight. <laughs> <laughs> if you're too young to understand that then that's okay just acknowledge our explicit tag mm -hmm. <laughs> but those are the seven and uh i knew we were going to get into a meaty discussion uh but is there anyone else that you want to talk to uh not really you mentioned mine hunter so shout out to cameron Britton. he plays hazel i fucking told you when we were watching season one and i saw hazel i'm like Babe, I think that's Kemper. And you're like, no, it's not. And I'm like, because he kind of looks a bit different. I think he had curly hair as well. Mm. Or there, there was he some had defining. Long hair. Yeah, he, he looked a bit different, but his voice as well. Mm. I was like, that's Kemper. Um, so there you go. We also gave a shout out to Mary J. Blige. Um, we talked about Reginald. We also talked about Grace a little bit. Uh, is there anything else you want to say about Pogo? Oh, oh it's sad that he died. It was a yeah. it was sort of but emotional. Does anyone really die? Maybe nah, they this don't, is like because it went back and we saw a little Pogo. I think so, this is anime level of like people just not dying. Yeah. Um. It it was interesting to see the way that they raised Pogo and they taught him. Um. I thought it was funny how he hurt Diego. Uh, <laughs> Diego is the swash bucket, like in this podcast. Mm. Uh, not in this podcast, in this show. Um. The handler. We haven't really talked about the handler at all. Mm hmm. She's only interested in herself, man. She, her goals, huh? She's ambitious as fuck. She's efficient, though. Mm -hmm. No? Well, she's, did you call her efficient? They they allude to some sort of entanglement with five. Yeah. But it's weird because I know that Aiden Gallagher is, like, underage, and she keeps, like, alluding to and just, like, not not in a sexual way, but she touches him, and I'm like... It, it feels weird to me. Mm. Um, but I, I think they had some sort of history. Yeah, they, they definitely had some sort of history. But I think that was more when he lived 45 years alone. Yeah. Mm. When he's giving his mannequin a break. Yeah. Um, she, I, I guess it was very interesting to see her. But to, to, to believe anything that she says, I think is a detriment to yourself. It's weird that, you know, with all of the powers that Five had, that he didn't sense something was awry. Mm. Uh, I guess the last thing that I uh, wanted to touch on is Lila Pitts. Mm. 
Mm -hmm. So, you know, we talked about it at the top of the episode that there were around 43 babies born at the same time around the world and possibly Lila is one of them. I think she's definitely one of them. I'm annoyed that... (sighs) I guess it's fine, but it's like they're they're not closing storylines that could be closed. So it's like, you know, we're going to come across her Mm. later on. I don't think she's a part of the Sparrow Academy, though. I don't think either. Do you think there's any sort of, um, like, do you care about Lila at all? I don't care about Lila's character. She annoyed the hell out of me. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) I don't know. She just, she was so fucking naive and... I don't, I don't buy that in a lot of sort of stories and characters that if you just had to put two and two together, uh-huh. she was given the hint that she was given a report of the handler having, you know, her mother or whatever, uh-huh. having a family killed and everyone. And she just, she just took everything weirdly. And yeah. like, I don't know. It just, it was weird. I didn't like her as a character at all. Yeah, but I think, you know, if she does come back to the show, they'll give her more storyline and then maybe we'll emotionally care about her. Oh, she's entitled as well. Ugh. She is. Um, so I guess if we see her, we see her. Um, I don't necessarily want to end on a negative note, but I do just want to round out um, season two and our feelings on it. Um What season one did for Umbrella Academy is an experience that I wish I could experience again. Mm. However, what I experienced in season two was an inferior carbon copy of what I experienced in season one. It's what I thought I was going to get in Umbrella Academy um, before I had ever watched it. And what I mean by that is uh, that there was a lot of lacking in emotional investment um, and any sort of emotional investment we had was inferred and it wasn't natural to how we were feeling as an audience. We were just told that we were supposed to care. Um, Even the fun sort of uh, song lyrics that Klaus would have was hampered by the lack of overarching narrative. Mm. Um, And all of Luther's uh, ribbing (laughs) and, uh, you know, gestury sort of comic relief was also hampered by its lack of overarching narrative. Yeah. Like, we know that you guys are going to reunite. We know there's going to be an impending apocalypse, possibly through Vanya. So let's move on. Mm. And unfortunately, that didn't happen until uh, episode five or episode six. Um, So I I guess it'll be interesting to see what season three will look like with the Sparrow Academy. Um, But at least in my heart, I'll always have season one. For sure. We are going to finish off in a segment we call For Your Reference. OT. Oh, it's quite obvious. I think um, the only sort of logical thing to reference here is Doom Patrol. Nice. Yeah. Well, you've got Katie. Uh, where? Where Where do you want to know what I have? Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, so we've, we've mentioned it quite a lot uh, throughout this episode, and it's also coming out in a month's time. So we are going to reference... As in me, myself, and I, yikes, um, are going to reference The Boys. Oh. Yep. So get those teats ready. Uh, Thank you, thank you, thank you. We take kindly to your kind around here. Um, If anything concerned you uh, during this episode, if anything concerned us during this episode, uh, feel free to fight with us on Twitter and Instagram. We are for your effort. You can write us an email at hello at fypodcast.com. We also have Apple Podcasts if you would like to rate and review us. And we'll see you guys next week. See ya. Bye.